People garden for different reasons, but once they get hooked, well, look at me, they're hooked for life. More on the love of gardening after this. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the show. Maybe you're born into it, or maybe you just stumble onto it by accident. But lately, I have to tell you, I've heard so many people tell me about how they've come into gardening. You know, for me, I grew up in it. I had generations of support of people who helped me learn how to nurture the soil and grow something beautiful. But for others, they've just come onto it recently. Maybe it's through buying a new home, just the love of cut flowers, or maybe they saw something grow in a science class. Well, today's show is dedicated to all of us who are crazy about gardening. Like Alda Ellis, known for her southern hospitality and being a fantastic hostess. Coming up, Alda shows us how to celebrate the front porch, a favorite spot for gardeners to be sure. Also, I'll share with you one of my garden passions, the rose. There's always a special occasion just around the corner where a bouquet of roses can come in handy, like Valentine's Day. Some tips for making beautiful arrangements just ahead. While roses do it for some gardeners, for others it's food, especially those who like to cook. Now you don't want to miss Chef Diana's Fresh from the Garden recipe, but first let's head over to Alda's front porch where she's laid out an afternoon snack and some items that are sure to please gardeners with a passion. We'll get a closer look right after the break, so don't go away. Alda Ellis isn't just passionate about gardening. She's also designed a product line that's all about lifestyle and considers it a personal privilege to make sure that everyone who steps foot on her porch enjoys the experience. To me, hospitality says welcome into my day. It says welcome into my home. I think it's what I call a checklist of the senses in the sense that I want something to offer my guests to taste, to drink, to um, I want them to have something pretty to look at. I want to put something in their hand when they leave. I want some kind of sound, whether it's wind chimes in the garden or the waterfall, the water fountain. So, um, I, and then the warmth of the conversation pulling heartstrings. And I think it's what I call the checklist of the senses. You know, being outdoors is my favorite place to entertain, whether it's just my son home from college, just the two of us, or whether it's a party for 50 or 200, because it, within each of the little rooms that you just get a close sense of intimacy and all the hard work in the garden, um, you have something beautiful to, to show what your work has been for, and you can certainly enjoy it, whether it's just a moment of solitude and a glass of iced tea. You know, we in the South love our iced tea as well as we do our hot tea. And um, I'm a big tea drinker in the sense that um, when I'm out here working in the yard, I always have a glass of iced tea close at hand. You know, one of the things that I like to do in my garden rooms is take outdoors the things that you normally wouldn't think of, whether it's uh, a treasured set of glasses, whether it's a silver teapot, to bring the indoors out. And sometimes you can take the outdoors in, whether it's a bird bath as a, a side table or, or using it as a piece of furniture, but to bring that indoors, something that you wouldn't normally think of, inside or outside on the patio is just, um, very welcoming and very uh, one of those little treasures for your soul that just you enjoy that little lace tablecloth or that little silver teapot and there's so many little little things that I've personalized each of the spaces as when you walk around our home you'll see that yes I do have my mom's vintage glasses her polka dot glasses and there's some silver pieces that you'll see that's just because that's what my company does. We reproduce historically sentimental silver pieces, whether they've either been in my family or someone else's family. Did you know that the rose has been grown in gardens since ancient times? Did you know that roses are edible? Did you know that different colored roses have different meanings? This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to roses. They're absolutely fascinating. I'll tell you a lot more after the break.
Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. You know, there's something magical about roses. I guess it's the myriad of shapes and forms and colors they come in. You know, in my own garden, I have over 40 different varieties. I just can't seem to get enough of them. I guess you could say I'm a hopeless collector. My favorites are the old-fashioned roses, and these would include those that were introduced before 1867, when the first hybrid teas came on the scene. Now, some of the examples I grow are Lamarck, Champney's Pink Cluster, and Madame Plantier. There are several reasons why I advocate using old roses. First of all, they seem to be more disease resistant and require less of my time to care for them. And then there's the fragrance. Well, after seeing all those beautiful images of roses, I bet you're wondering, how can I grow some of those in my garden? Well, let's start with a few basics. Generally speaking, roses need to be planted where they have at least six hours of sunlight. Now, once you've determined a suitable location, then it's time to decide the type of rose you want. Maybe it's a climber to cover a wall or a shrub rose to fill up a void in the garden. You know, there's so many roses out there to choose from, but I think the best course of action, once you've narrowed down the location and type, is to take some pictures of the area where you want roses to be planted and present them to a knowledgeable garden center employee and find a rose they have in stock that will work for you. Or you can take a risk and just pick up one that you like and give it a shot. Now only occasionally has this not worked for me because I love virtually every rose. But one rose I chose several years ago is called Clotilde Super. It's an old French variety. Unfortunately, the petals never fell off and they just dried and looked like toilet tissue after a rain. So after a few years, I just ripped it out. Now one way to buy roses is bare root. And if you choose this approach, you'll want to plant these in late winter or early spring for best performance. If you're like me, you love roses. But as you know, they've developed quite a reputation over the years for being difficult to grow. This doesn't have to be true. To grow roses successfully, you just have to start by placing the plants in the right place and following a few basic planting principles. If you're planting roses that you've ordered through the mail, the first thing you'll want to do is get them out of the plastic bag and make sure that your order is complete. Then check each one and make sure there are no broken roots or stems. If so, prune them. I'll soak these roots in water to rehydrate the plants, but for no more than 24 hours. When you're planting your roses, placing them properly in the garden is critical. You want to make sure that they get at least six hours of direct sunlight a day. You also want to make sure that you get plenty of good air circulation. You see, this will help cut down on fungal problems later in the season. As for the soil, you want a good rich garden loam that's well drained. To give my roses a boost, I always like to amend my existing garden soil. I take two parts of the existing soil to one part of my homemade compost and mix them with one part well-rotted manure in a wheelbarrow. The size of the hole needs to be at least large enough to spread all of the roots out and about 14 to 18 inches deep. These hybrid teas need to be about three to four feet apart. When I plant, I gently spread the roots and alternate the layers of soil mix with a solution of fish emulsion and water to give them a good start. Now once these little guys are nestled into their new home, in just a few months, you won't believe the results. Late winter and early spring is an ideal time to prune roses, including climbers. Now, I can't imagine my garden without climbing roses. They're a great way to accent different aspects of my garden, whether it's a fence or a wall or even a tool shed. I prune my climbing roses severely once a year. Now this helps stimulate lots of new growth, which makes them produce larger flowers and a lot more of them. It also helps me achieve a goal of getting this rose to grow over the top of this arbor and cover the bonnet in lots of white blooms. To prune a rose of this size, all you'll need is a good pair of sharp pruners and some gloves. But before we get started, I want to tell you a little story about this plant. I planted two roses on each side of this arbor five years ago, and they were just two gallon plants. I chose this variety because it's an old fashioned variety. It was introduced in 1901. It's the White American Beauty, or sometimes called Snow Queen, or Frau Karl Drewski. Because of its large, showy white blossoms, it's one of the most popular white roses in history. When I prune, I always take out all dead and diseased wood. Then I take out any stems that are smaller than the diameter of a pencil. 
When I make each cut, I try to make them as clean as possible and about a quarter of an inch above a bud. It's important to know that the position of the bud on the stem is the direction the new growth will head once it starts growing. So I always try to cut just above a bud that's going to grow up and over the arbor. It has been said that the sense of smell is our strongest link to memories. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why we associate roses with special occasions. Like so many, I've long admired the scent of the rose. In the spring, there's nothing like stepping out into the garden as the warmth of the sun begins to open the buds and release their fragrance over the breeze. Now, after the break, I'll show you an arrangement that uses roses. Wouldn't this be an elegant gift for a hostess or as a centerpiece? Details after this. Welcome back. I once heard someone say you should never get between a farmer and his tractor. Well, I guess the same could be said about getting between a gardener and his trowel. This show is all about the passion and love of gardening. Earlier, we met up with Alda for tea on her porch. She reminds us to take time to sit back and enjoy the fruits of our labor. We've also been talking about roses, and I gave you some tips on growing these beauties in your garden. All right, now I'd like to share with you some ideas on using the roses you grow. They're beautiful in arrangements. What I'm working on here is a simple arrangement for this container. And I'm using as a base or a backdrop here this leucodendron. It's called Safari Sunset. And in the front here, I'm using this wonderful little floral bunda rose. Just look at the color. This variety is called Tropical Amazon. Now I think the colors work so well together. Just look at the, the red tips of the leucodendron and how they work so well with the rose. All right, so I have the structure in place, the leucodendron in the back, the rose here. I'm gonna mass in the rose, and then I'm gonna use this little mini calla, which has a great sort of golden color to it. That along with this hypericum, or St. John's wort, with its chartreuse berries. I think the combination of colors will be electrifying. Okay, now it's time for viewer mail. Today we have a question from Jan in Houston, and she writes, Alan, I would really enjoy having cut flowers that I can grow in my garden and bring inside. Do you have any ideas on what I could plant? Well, Jan, if you've been watching the show, you know that roses make great cut flowers, but there are also lots of others you may want to consider. One good source is go to my website, pallensmith.com. There we've listed a lot. Yara or Achillea, bells of Ireland and delphiniums. I love using these in arrangements. Bachelor buttons, coxcomb or celoisia, calla lilies, daisies, daffodils. Remember to plant these in the fall for spring bloom. And who could forget the long-lasting beauty of purple cone flowers, love in a mist, peonies, sunflowers, and you can't miss with zinnias. Now, Jan, many of these flowers can be grown directly from seed. And in fact, some of them are really good increasers or reseeders. They come back as hardy volunteers year after year. So give them a try. Since this show is all about garden passions, I have to share one more with you. It's all about vegetables. You see, not only are they good to eat, they're beautiful. The way I look at it, they not only feed the body, they also feed the soul because they're so satisfying to grow. Just take a look at these pictures of my vegetable garden. The beds are raised and are laid out in a geometrical design. I mix in vegetables, flowers, herbs, just about anything else that strikes my fancy, like this whimsical scarecrow. Now when you plan your vegetable garden, find a location that gets six to seven hours of sunlight a day. And it's also good to choose a location that's convenient, one that's close to your supplies or your tools. For instance, my raised vegetable beds flank the tool shed. By gardening in raised beds, I find that I save time on weeding and that planting and harvesting are much easier. Now to add a little pizzazz to the beds, consider adding vertical elements in the center for height and drama, or place a container in the center for color. The garden continues to inspire us in this show. Up next, a talented chef shares a recipe for this go. beautiful dish, so don't go away.
When Chef Diana first opened Cafe 1217, she had a hunch that her fresh gourmet items would be a hit with customers. And boy, was she right. Diana shares one of her simple dishes, which takes its inspiration from the gardens of Italy. People are very passionate about the fruits and vegetables that come from their garden. That's why this salad is so perfect. The salad has Roma tomatoes, fresh basil, and mozzarella, and nice crusty bread croutons. This is a, a traditional Italian salad called panzania. Pan means bread in Italian, so let's start with the bread. I've split some crusty bread in half, and next I like to rub a little garlic clove on to the bread to give it some flavor. Now we just cube the bread. Just toss this with a little olive oil and add some cracked pepper and bake them for 20 minutes at 325. And this is your finished product. As delicious as these are, we're gonna save these for last. Um, I've got some julienne basil that we're gonna add into our mixing bowl first. Roma tomatoes, red wine vinegar, lemon juice, fresh mozzarella, a little kosher salt, fresh garlic, red pepper flakes, and some fresh ground pepper. Then a little olive oil. Give that a nice toss and let it marinate for 30 minutes. Add your croutons. Give this another toss. And there you go, a delicious panzania salad. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile 